Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled March 19th Board of Education meeting. If you would take a few seconds here and turn off any cell phones um, that might be on, they interfere with our TV broadcast. And if you would rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order of business, Secretary McFarland, could you please take attendance? Yes, I can. President Singer. Here. Vice President Branstad. Here. Treasurer Frazee. Here. Member Baker. Member Here. Member Fredell. Here. We have a quorum. Very good. Thank you. Moving into the consent agenda, we have five items. Approval of the minutes from February 19th. We have staff members who had announced their um, resignations. Approval of the 2018 summer wa uh, wage rates for teachers and employees for summer school. Approval of payment of the school system bills for the month of January and legal invoices for payment. Do we have any additions or deletions from the consent agenda? I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. I move approval of consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.5. Support. Okay, we have moved by Angela and support by Mary. And we will move into item 3.0. No, we have to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approval of consent agendas 2.1 through 2.5? Aye. 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 Opposed? And it's unanimous. <coughs> Moving into item 3.0, we've got the Board of Education Matters presentation to the board. Mr. Sherrill? As you know, we, um, Midland High School received a Educational Excellence Award this year, sponsored by SETSAG Insurance Company and MASB, and we have representatives from both those organizations here tonight to present that to us. So I will have uh, Scott and company come up. If you'd like to take over the mic and do your presentation, introduce yourself. I think so. <laughs> Is that better? I, I can't hear you yet. No. Is it on? Is that better? There, yeah. there okay. you go. Thank you. Well, thank you for everybody um, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Fritz. I'm with Satseg. And um, Matt is with MASB. And we just wanted to come and present the award to, to Jeff and his staff with um, for the program to help the, the youth in the summer program, which is phenomenal. And SETSEG and MASB have been partnering for over 25 years, and this is our 25th year of, of giving this award. And so uh, there was over 300 applicants that had to write in a grant with specific details and requirements to, be, to become eligible for the award. So to be one of 25 across the state, about over 300, is, is a tremendous uh, accomplishment. So we want to say thank you. Um, we have this green sign that Matt is holding. It's a representation. I get to take this one with me, but you will be given an actual same size full um, steel sign that you can hang outside of the school where you would like to. And then also we have this official award, um, official award that, you, that you can keep as well. And the check is also here that can go on to further uh, fund the program. So thank you for all you do for, for students. We appreciate all of your hard work. And thanks again. I was elected to speak for the group. So uh, first, thank you both for coming up to present tonight. Uh, we are really excited. This is the first time that Midland High School has received this award. Um, but I think it certainly is a tribute to all of the hard work uh, that these folks have put in over the past summer. And I'll say that we're excited and planning for Chemic Challenge 2018. Um, I, I wasn't going to re hash the program because we had a chance to present to all of you in September, so I know you've heard about it, but again, we're excited and planning for the next Chemic Challenge. So thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Can we take a minute and just, if the board has uh, any questions for, or comments for the Jeff, group? can you just reintroduce oh, folks with you tonight? Sure. Actually, um, Helena McDonald is at the end. 
uh, Eric Krause, Fred Dingman, Ryan Wontorsik here in the middle. Uh, Bob Skirfield's one of our assistant principals. This is Connie Stagger, uh, learning coach, and then Anthony Gates, teacher at Midland High. Very good. Awesome, you guys. Yeah, what thanks. a great idea. Thank you. We, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for uh, all your hard work, and it's wonderful. I can hardly wait for the sign to go up, and uh, I was really excited to see Midland High uh, get this sign, and I look forward to seeing what you guys come up for next year, too. So thanks for all the hard work. Thank you for your thank support. You. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> we'll move right into Shining Stars here. Um, if Tyler and Hubbard would come up and join me. So I'm going to read about Tyler as he makes his way up today. Tyler began his MPS career in 2015. He teaches industrial education classes at Jefferson Middle and H.H. Dow High Schools. Before coming to MPS, Tyler taught industrial education technology in CAD in Chippewa Hills, Greenville, Wakefield, and Bessemer. Tyler earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Central Michigan University in 2008 and his Master's of Science degree in Administration also from CMU in 2014. Tyler was nominated for a Shining Star by an MPS parent. Among their comments were the following. Mr. Hubbard does a fantastic job of keeping his students engaged in interest in vocational education. Two of my three boys have been lucky to have him for a teacher more than once. Both have had his classes this year. They always come home excited about the class. They have gained so much knowledge about designing and building. At the Jefferson Curriculum Night, all the parents decided they wished they could take his classes because <laughs> they are so interesting. <laughs> my eighth grader is considering a different career direction because of all he has learned from Mr. Hubbard's classes. Congratulations, Tyler. Tyler has his hands full. I will hold these and then give them to you after if you want. If you want to go around and <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Cassandra Stoffer Hansen. Hopefully, I pronounced those right, Cassandra. Let me read a little bit about Cassie. Cassie has been with Midland Public Schools since 2015 as a, be as a prof paraprofessional at Plymouth Elementary School. Before beginning her employment with Midland Public Schools, Cassie was a dedicated, valued parent volunteer. Cassie was nominated for a shining star by MPS staff members who said, Cassie is an amazing asset to our school. She is in tune with students in a way that makes teachers around her listen carefully. She has a true heart for at-risk children and is able to connect with them in a purposeful, meaningful, helpful, and magic manner. She is truly deserving of this recognition. Miss Cassie is definitely worth the Shining Star Award. She is always working to help students in any way she can to make them feel good about themselves and make sure they have what they need to be successful and stay busy. She is a caring individual who works well with students and teachers. She helped to make recess play safer by requesting <laughs> tag flags so the students <laughs> could play games safely. That makes sense if you've seen an elementary playground. <laughs> she is also working with teachers and students by developing a behavior monitoring and intervention tracker for students. She goes above and beyond for Plymouth students and staff. We are lucky to have her as part of our staff. Congratulations, Kathy. Thank you. Another presentation for you. Busy night, as you know. And we have H.H. Stow here doing a presentation uh, with about the Charger Yearbook and update. And we'll, I think Mr. Poole will uh, introduce who he has with him tonight. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> First off, I want to say, go ahead. Ben. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Mary and, and Lynn, for making it to our 50th yesterday. I, I know everybody's busy, but uh, it's been neat to be a part of three different 50, 50 years at uh, buildings and actually 175 at Central when I was there. So uh, I know a lot of work and energy goes into that. And I know Jenny Coppins was in charge of it at Dow High School, so I really want to make sure that she, she knows that I appreciate that. And it, it was a lot of work. It was very unique as a history guy to hear uh, Mrs. Clark, Jim Clark's 
uh, wife. Jim was the first principal at Dow High School, and she gave a great speech on the history of Dow High School. And one of the most unique things was when they were thinking about mascots, and one of the options was the black and blue bruisers, which I <laughs> thought would have been hilarious <laughs> for Dow High School, but we're glad that we're the Chargers. I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Cammie Hall, uh, who does not only our yearbook, but also our school newspaper. And we have three fantastic students as well, Ben Zeitler, uh, Regan O'Brien, and Maggie, du Maggie Dooley. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and hopefully you have lots of questions for them, because they're ready for them. All right. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, I'm going to start us off uh, talking a little bit about the beginning journalism um, path that the students can take. Um, so the beginning journalism experience um, is students can be 9th through 12th grade, uh, anybody who's interested in it, and we give them a variety of writing, visual components. They get to go out and do photography, design, graphics, you name it. Um, and most of it is the prep for the next level that they may go to, which is to become part of a staff, whether it's yearbook or newspaper. Um, they have a choice from that end of it. Um, and we try to give the kids lots of opportunities to get their work published. The update has an online component, which allows us a lot more freedom to be able to publish the work, even with the beginning journalism students. And then they get a chance to work with the editors um, and understand what that's like to go through the process. One of the great things that we started a couple years ago is reviving the literary magazine. And so working with Sarah Hecklick in the English department and Kirk Gledhill in the art department, we call together all different works that students have done throughout the year. And then my students, the beginning students, um, go through all of that, decide what can be put into the printed edition of the Fragments magazine. And so it's a collection of um, poems and short stories, narratives, you name it, and then the artwork we try to match with it. So the students get a firsthand look at trying to decide editorial content, what's going to go together, visually appealing designs, uh, and then having to lay it out on pages, meeting deadlines so that it can get to print in time to get back to us. So that gives them their first printed edition. And we've now done two. Uh, we'll be doing our third one this spring here. Um, the other thing that we've started is to do a um, video news broadcast. So the students get to do two of those in the spring. The first one is a 10-minute package they put together with different video stories. It's all pre-edited and then sent out to all of the teachers who then play it during the announcement period. The second one, however, is live. And so the students actually have to be on air during that particular time, be the anchors, and have to transition between um, any clips or any video packages that we have and be prepared for any glitches at the same time <laughs> as well. So we do two 10-minute um, broadcasts in the spring for these kids. So um, this is kind of the introductory look at that end of it. And then we decided, why well, stop there? So working with um, Ted Davis a couple years ago, they teamed up with the NFHS network, which houses a lot of video streaming for sports. So I started to work with him, with the kids, to put together sports streaming um, and a chance for them to start producing actual sports shows. So what began as a simple camera and graphics kind of setup has now expanded, thanks to the sports boosters, to actually having two on-air announcers. So these kids get to practice doing play-by-play -play and commentary. They have to do the research, talk to coaches ahead of time, try to gather the information, work off rosters. Um, so it's been fun. It's been a little crazy with technical stuff, but they're learning and having a, a great time with it. Um, we've been able to do football games this uh, fall. We've we focused a lot on basketball because it's an easy setup in the building. And then um, I have several kids that are now interested in doing baseball. So we're working out the logistics of that in the spring here as well. So, um, so that's been kind of the fun part. Uh, and then before I turn it over to these guys to tell you all about the program some more, um, these are three organizations that we are members of. The Columbia Scholastic Press Association, um, the National Scholastic Press Association, and the Michigan Interscholastic Press Association. Um, 
the these two bottom ones, the Columbia and the um, or CSPA and NSPA, are national uh, programs, and there we've um, won several awards. We're being judged against schools all over the U.S. as well as with CSPA, um, sometimes in the world. And just recently, CSPA did their crown awards, and the update received another silver crown just on Friday. So for their work. So it's very exciting to get a chance to compete with other students who are trying to produce newspapers, um, both print and online. So we do a hybrid. So they're looking at all of those components there as well. Um, and these are some of the photos that we've had from going to these different camps um, and the conferences here. Um, one of the ones that was a great opportunity is uh, NSPA had one in the fall. They changed their locations. But the one in 2015 was in Disney. And when I said to the kids, hey, does anybody want to go to Disney? <laughs> 11 of them were like, yes. So we took a trip down to Disney and went to the, the national conference down there. It was the largest con conference they've ever had, almost 6,500 students from across the nation that were there. And we got to do a lot of workshops and presentations and, and have some fun also going to Magic Kingdom. So <laughs> it was a great time. Um, but I'm going to let these guys who um, can tell you more about uh, MIPA and that end. So, Ben Zeitler, um, Hi, I'm Ben Zeitler. I'm a managing sports, managing sports editor, columnist, staff writer, and page designer on the update staff. Um, first, I'll talk about MIPA. I've been to two of the MIPA summer uh, workshops, and both of them were highlights of my summer. In 2016, I took the sports writing class, and uh, Mr. Jim Worley was my instructor. Uh, I learned a great deal about not only sports reporting, but also the world of journalism as a whole. And while I was at the camp in 2016, I uh, had a few memorable things that I did uh, in that class. First of all, I attended pro amateur, a pro amateur game that featured Miles Bridges, Tum Tum Naren, Tum Tum Naren, and a few other prominent basketball players. And we got the opportunity to interview players, and it was a fantastic experience for me, especially as a person who's very enthusiastic about sports. Um, uh, we also played in a volleyball tournament, we watched movies, we played board games, and a lot more that also contributed to the uh, just enjoyment of the camp or the workshop. Um, while I was there, I won the award for the best sports column in 2016, and it was my first ever column, so that was a testament to the tremendous job that Mr. Worley did in teaching the course and by extension the whole workshop uh -huh. and that was a great help to all the staffers that were a part of the 2016-2017 staff. Uh, most importantly I made friends that I still keep in touch with to this day um, because these camps bring people with com common interests together. For instance I was uh, I was talking back and forth with a former uh, classmate uh, during the Michigan game on Saturday and we were both Michigan fans and so when Jordan Poole, our favorite player, hit that shot, we both went crazy. <laughs> but, so that just goes to show the bonds you form at a workshop like MIPA. Um, and then in 2017, I took the news editor editors class with Maggie uh, and this class focused more on the leadership aspect of being on a newspaper staff. Uh, I learned a lot from the, from the class including how to effectively work a staff writer through the editing process of a story. And I also took what I learned and applied to my leadership in football and basketball and also in student government. Uh, and again, Maggie took the class with me and she had other experiences that also overlapped with mine. So I'll let her take over. Hello, my name is Maggie Dooley. I'm the editor in chief of the update at Dow High. Um, so, uh, as Ben said, we both took the news editors course at the MIPA summer camp. Uh, MIPA is a really great uh, workshop. I was only able to go my senior year, um, but uh, it was a really great opportunity to prepare me for the big challenge ahead. Um, we uh, took the news editors course together to really uh, understand what it is to coach a staff. Uh, our staff was very new this year. Um, all of my managing editors had never been uh, in an editing position before, so this class really set up for the rest of the year. 
Dean Hume was our advisor and he is from Ohio. He taught us a ton about the coaching process. Um, he uh, helped us gain a new perspective on how to coach um, staffers. He also helped us with our communication skills. I know that journalism has really helped me with my communication skills. I don't think I'd be able to um, work through situations as I do now without the journalism program. So um, MIPA also has a spring conference where we get to uh, celebrate our hard work and we choose stories and submit them in specific categories. And then in the spring conference, we all go as a staff, as many people that can go, um, and they tell us if our stories won or not, and that's also when we find out if we got a Spartan Award. <coughs> so I guess we can transition on to some of the work that we've been doing this year. Um, so as you can see over here, this was my last story from the last cycle um, published on March 8th. It was a story about the Midland Canine Unit. There is one Midland Canine officer. His name is Saeed. I think I pronounced that a little rough. Um, he, uh, he's one of the dogs that comes and does sniff searches at the high schools. And so a lot of kids are not very informed about what happens. So uh, one of the staffers suggested that we should do an informative piece on um, you know, what goes on during sniff searches. So uh, me and another staffer, Cameron McGee, were able to go to the Midland Police Department. And as you can see in that photo, we were able to witness um, him attacking an officer, m like a mock presentation of it, um, in his bite sleeve. And then also we got a couple of cute shots of the dog as well. <laughs> um, so this is just a great example of all of the opportunities that were provided when we're uh, doing stories. Um, we get to meet people that we probably would never meet, like I said, the police officers, um, public officials, people we wouldn't encounter if we weren't doing informative pieces on them. Um, and so that has really helped me gain communication skills, and I know um, a lot of other staffers, they get to learn how to conduct themselves when they're in the presence of an adult that they wouldn't normally meet, and so um, they're gaining a lot of new skills. Also, we try to uh, connect all of our stories back to the students at Dow High. Um, talking a little bit of that, our mission statement for the update is, as a public forum for student expression, update will honor the HH Dow High community and the journalist profession by placing truth, accuracy, and objectivity from first and <laughs> enc uh, encouraging all sides to voice their opinions. So that's just a little bit about what we do. We encourage all students to um, share their voices. We have letters uh, to the editor. Um, we have our update online where we try to post news uh, rapidly um, so that if there's something that happens, since we're only a monthly uh, publication, we can put it right on our website and put a link out on Twitter or social media, uh, which is another thing that we do to communicate news. So I just want to bring it back to Ben so he can tell you about his last story that he published. Um. And first of all, Maggie talked a little bit about how we would get the opportunity to talk with people that we normally wouldn't, specifically adults. Uh, in fact, I, inter or I interviewed Dave Marsh, the Northwood Athletic Director, after school today. And we had a great discussion concerning my current story, which is uh, concerning the pros and cons of, of paying college athletes. Um, and then this year, I've also interviewed a former Michigan player, a former NFL player, and a swimmer who participated in Pan American Games and almost made the Olympics. And the best part of that is that all of these really cool athletes were Dow High grads, and I would <laughs> not have known that without the journalism program. Uh, the screenshot here with the environment keeping it clean, um, that's the story I did last issue uh, when I wrote about the Dow High janitors. Uh, students come in each day, um, and they come into clean classrooms and facilities. Um, but no one really thinks of the people that are behind the scenes putting the effort to uh, make our school look good. And so it's interesting to see a new perspective. Uh, and that's what I find coolest about journalism. There's almost always a litany of angles to choose from for each story. Um, and that's especially valuable in today's times when you see a wide variety of things on the internet ranging from Fox News to online site. Um, on online sites, you just you're not sure what to believe. So as a journalist, it's helped me to see through uh, the things that may not be true and be able to dig a little bit deeper and verify facts. 
Um, another thing that journalism ha has helped me with was uh, peer interaction and making each other better. Uh, as, a, as an editor, it's my job to work people through stories and uh, put out the best version of each story uh, possible. And uh, it's nice for teachers to intervene and be able to talk. We get that every day in class, but it's something new to hear it from a person on your own level. And I find it to be more impactful and more influential. Um, and then finally, I would just like to say that my experiences <coughs> on the Dow High staff have inspired me to uh, want to join a student publication at the collegiate level. I'm not sure where I'll be attending yet, but it's definitely something that I'd like to pursue. So thank you. Hello, I am Reagan O'Brien and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Yearbook at Dow High. And similar to Maggie and Ben, I was also able to attend some workshops over the summer. I attended the Herf Jones Yearbook Camp at Grand Valley State University with two other staff members and we took third place for our theme development, which was It All Started, which we ended up using for the 50th edition for the yearbook coming out this May. And this theme was meant to show where we came from 50 years ago and the tradition previous charges started for us and also allude to the journey and the traditions that we are creating today. Um, over the summer, I also attended the Washington Journalism and Media Conference at George Mason University in Washington, D.C. It was a week-long program where we got to hear and speak with um, very respected journalists, including the editor-in-chief of the National Geographic magazine. And it was a, an amazing experience, and it really allowed me to hone in on those journalism skills and even more spark my interest in being able to tell people's stories. But most importantly, being a part of the Dow High Yearbook staff has really made a significant significant impact on my life. Um, starting on the staff, I was very, very shy. I did not like talking to people, and it pushed me out of my comfort zone immensely and allowed me to really hone in on my leadership skills and also my communication skills. So it has been an incredible experience, and I cannot thank Cami Hall and the entire staff enough for allowing me to have that experience over these past couple of years. Um, as it says up here, we are a 200-page book and a 30-page supplement. And like I said earlier, this is our 50th anniversary. And after we leave here today, we are going to submit the book to be printed in May. So thank you so much for having us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, we'd like, love to open it up to questions here. Um, I'll open it up to the board. Any questions or comments? Are you all seniors now? Okay. Have you decided where you're going to school? Are you going to, I, I know Ben, I think you said you were going to look at going on to a, a collegiate newspaper. Any yeah. takers, journalism, your? Um, well, I meant to say this earlier, but <laughs> I'm uh, going to be attending Northern Michigan University. Uh, I'm going to be uh, looking into uh, legal studies and communication, specifically communication. Um, I wouldn't have gone on this level. I think I would have probably gotten something science related if I hadn't been exposed to journalism. I actually stumbled upon journalism my freshman year. I wanted to get out of Spanish three. So <laughs> I went into beginning journalism. That was the only other open course. Um, not a big Spanish speaker. Um, so I, beginning journalism was the only open course. And I was like, you know, this is very interesting. So Jimmy encouraged me to. Um, you know, continue on to the update staff. And I just, I found that I really like writing. And so um, I felt that that would be a good profession to go into. You're doing a lot of writing, a lot of research and legal studies. And then as well, I probably would have never thought about communications, but just the way I interact with people, the way I get to tell stories, hear people's stories, um, I really wanted to go into something where I could do that. So I'm looking into communications. Awesome. I'm probably going to try to do <coughs> a little bit of um, writing on the side, you know, with the clubs and things. And I will be attending Miami University of Ohio, and I'm going on a communication path with a minor in sociology. But I'm also, um, I really want to get involved in a communication, whether it be their school newspaper or any kind of literary magazine or something like that. Awesome. I just wanted to say, too, I um, can see that you are all risk takers, that you're willing to uh, step out there out of your comfort zone and try something new and different. And kudos to uh, Cami as well for for you know uh, taking on and so many different ways that you guys are using the communication to keep um, people informed and uh, it's really great, really nice program. I had, a, 
had a question about uh, you mentioned a magazine called Fragments, it's a collection of of writings and poetry. You've had two editions now, is that correct? Yes. How how many people contributed to their first couple editions? Do you have a, a big a big uh, outreach or big result? Uh, how many students contributed to mm -hmm. it? Um, more than we could put in the magazine. Awesome. So, um, and we also open it up to middle school kids. So we usually try to set aside two pages for their works as well. So um, they do go through a screening process and some of them are just not of high enough quality. And then of course the limited space that we have, that we have had to turn kids down. Is that distributed with the newspaper on the same kind of cycle or? Um, we just do one per year and it is distributed usually with the senior issue or the last issue of the update in the end of May, right. so. Thank you, yep. sounds great. Ben, I had to comment that it's really cool that you got to interview all those awesome and amazing athletes, a Pan American swimmer, um, University of Michigan football player, and an NFL player. Um, I'd have to imagine that if I were to guess, I bet that NFL player was also a CMU Chippewa at one time. That's right. <laughs> but I have one correction. You kind of flowed in with that, that Mr. Marsh is not a Dow High graduate. Mr. Marsh is a Midland High graduate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he was my neighbor growing up next door to me. <laughs> but awesome and amazing. Thank you very much for sharing all the interview stories. Great job. I know you guys spend, you didn't allude to how many hours and hours that you spent. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that you're there very late, aren't you? A lot of nights, especially when you're, what do they call it, getting ready to publish or whatever? Production. Yeah. Production. Production, yes. <laughs> so. Well, and that's why, yeah, Reagan, you said that, that yes, you guys were going back. So thank you all for your commitment. I, I always love reading the newspaper, so. It's a very quality publication, and um, yes, we all look forward to it when C Cindy uh, delivers yeah. them to us. Did you know that? We get them every month. So yes, if you did not know that. <laughs> My <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> and I wasn't aware that you had an online version and uh, you were also on uh, uh, social media as well. So I'll look for that and keep up the great work. It's just wonderful to, s to see and feel your excitement about journalism and, and about uh, education at Dow High. And I'm so glad you were able to come out here and share that with us as well. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And next on the agenda, we have item 3.4 for information. We have uh, classroom and special education realignment plans. Mr. Sherrill? Yep, so, so a little bit hard to see on the screen, but I did send that, and you, each of you have that document in front of you. So to try to not take too much time tonight, but I need to give you a little background on this. So almost five years ago, I arrived in the district, and as I went around to learn um, about the district to every building, it became somewhat evident to me, particularly at Seabird Elementary, where we knew we had some uh, issues of um, overcrowding in classroom space, um, placement of special education programs or high need students. And um, it, it, with Seabird in the, in the consolidation, it seemed like uh, we just placed programs wherever we found an open space. And so that happened throughout the district. And we had um, pro overload of programs in certain areas. We had um, higher enrollments in certain areas. And um, then when um, we decided to build Central Park, um, we've kind of had the same issue going forward where we now have about a 70% at-risk population at Central Park, 70% um, of a large number, about 800 students as well. And so for the last two years, the elementary principals and I have taken a look at um, reconfiguration and what we'd call balancing out that at-risk population special needs program and then maybe alignment as well and so some programs were crossing town at different times they were leaving their peer groups um, and so we kind of balked away from it last year it was a difficult problem that we weren't really seeing a solution to and then this year when we um, decided to open Carpenter um, in the fall of 18 it will open up four classroom spaces with the two young fives and the two four-year-old programs moving into that building and so we decided to take one more shot with knowing that we had four classroom spaces and how it might that configure out so in front of you we have what we believe would be a, a balancing out and alignment of the majority of the programs in the district. 
Now I need to be mindful as well to tell you that um, we don't have just NPS programs, but we also have ISD sponsored programs in our buildings. And so um, that's a rental basis. They move they, in the facilities and they, they probably have had the worst alignment um, throughout the time because they were placed at many different places and often moved around with um, the consolidation of five elementary schools, the consolidation and closing of Central um, Intermediate School. We really don't have too much of this problem at the high school. We have plenty of classroom space going forward. Then um, the last piece I need to add to that is because the elementary enrollment has either been stable or up, I, it was presumed when you consolidate it that our elementary enrollment would continue to go down. It has not, thankfully, um, but it has caused some issues into this problem as well. And as you know, we ha added an additional classroom onto Woodcrest, for example. Um, we do have an ongoing problem to the north. We know the, the amount of students um, who are now being housed north of I-10 in the Larkin Township area is an issue for us. It has um, made Woodcrest and Siebert vulnerable. And so this is one piece of the puzzle that would alleviate some of that crowding. But you certainly probably have a little more work left to do on that. I won't kid you on that. Um, I think we probably have a little bit of rezoning we're going to have to do at some point um, as that continued growth in Larkin Township happens. So. Um, we think we came up with a pretty good plan, but I do think there's some people here that's going to talk to you tonight that maybe will tell you different. Um, we do have um, some parents with the ESA um, um, autistic program that is housed at Central Park who um, do not feel this is a real good pro plan. They'll explain that to you a little later, I think. Um, but I wanted to hear for information. I sent it to you in the Friday letter. You got the background verbally, and we'll hear from them a little later on as we go. Okay, very good. Appreciate your. Um, communications and charts. Okay, now we will go uh, to item 3.4 for action. No, no action on that one. That was just for information four. Three. Oh, th I'm sorry, 3.5 for action. And that one will be a roll call when you get to it. Okay, we have the Regional Enhancement Millage Renewal Resolution adoption. <coughs> Talk about it or just and are you, did you want to talk about it or, did, or shall I just read it? I can talk about it. I was going to wait to see if you had a motion and acceptance in the discussion, but um, okay. I can do that now. So um, um, nine years ago, you, um, the county came out and asked for an enhancement millage. It's one of the only ways left for school districts to ask locals to, to uh, support funding for schools. And so it is regional. It is the four public school districts in Midland County. And with new recent legislation, it also includes public charter schools. And we have two that sit in our boundary. They'll be receiving funds out of this all as well, smaller, but um, funds out of this as well. And so that was nine years ago, the superintendents, and it comes to the ISD. So the money flows the ISD out to the four publics. They do not get any of the funding, but they have to call for the election. And so it's an ISD election. And um, my first seven, eight months on the job, we renewed it. Um, and we are near that timeline to renew it again. And so we would li we'd like to have it on the August ballot um, at that time. It would give us an opportunity, if we weren't successful, to come back one more time before you would stop collecting funds on this. Um, it's brought in um, bras over a million dollars per year. If you can imagine what would occur if we lost that million mm -hmm. dollars. Um, the, in the past, we have tried to list items that we would use the funds for. There is no statutory language that says that you must do those things. But we kind of wanted to make sure voters knew when we do it, so we have kind of blocked those funds and showed that we would use those. Um, things like textbook purchases, curriculum purchases, and we've listed buses before. Well, as you know, with the bond, buses would not be an item that would get, need to be needed for the next, I believe, don't hold me exact years, 10 years um, going out on the bond issue. Um, so I have a thought on this. Um, with the, certainly our recent upgrades to security, we've moved forward with uh, Sally Port entries and um, surveillance cameras and card access. Um, but there's probably more to be done um, with alert systems as well as maybe resource officers. And so we are fortunate that the City of Midlands funds us too. We thank them very much for that, our two high schools. 
Um, but I think in the perfect world, if we could get an additional two, we covered our four secondary buildings as the primary, and each of those four officers uh, rotated through our elementaries. Um, two of those elementaries sitting right next to the middle school makes that job a little easier. Um, certainly the threat of an officer in that building assist, as well as they often put out many fires before they get there. Um, and of course the response, if we had an emergency, would be so much quicker with them in our building. So something we can talk about, and I'd like to talk about that, it's not for tonight um, as far as adding that as, as a proposal. We can bring that through our committee structures and up to the full board for discussion. But um, it is time to renew. We are looking for you to uh, make that motion to renew that. So the ESA has those responses back. The four locals have to take action, and then they take their final action to put it on the ballot for us. Thank you. Well, then at this time, I would uh, entertain a motion for item 3.5. I'll make the motion. I move to approve the resolution to place a regional enhancement millage renewal question before the voters at a special election to be held on Tuesday, August 7th, 2018, requesting that the Midland County Educational Service Agency, ISD, submit a renewal proposal for 1.5 mills for five years, 2019 through 2023, inclusive in accordance with Section 705 of the Revised School Code. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Um, support. Okay, motion by McFarland, support by Brandstadt. Um, all in favor, say aye. Uh, oh, sorry. Roll call vote. Discussion. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I'm out of practice. <laughs> okay, is there uh, one thing I was um, wanting to <coughs> add to um, your, your discussion on it, uh, Mike, was I think as well it would be wonderful to have the resource officers on those campuses creating uh, relationships, positive relationships with the kids as well. I think that's uh, something we've seen in the high schools has been very beneficial and I think we saw that in the middle schools and, and even in the elementary schools it, it would go a long way. Yep, they certainly um, proactively take care of the situations before they ever grow when they build those relationships with the kids. So, well, I mean, I just want to say this. So this will be the third time, and just to reiterate that this is just a renewal, and that it has to be done countywide. It's not something that Midland Public. This is, you know, if we're going to go forth, and it wasn't a bond, and it wasn't a sinking fund, that this is our option. We do it as a whole, and the money comes back into our district. I think it's by based on head count, if I remember, or Correct. something. Yeah. So we're approximately seventy-two percent of the county population, and so we would get seventy-two percent of those funds. That's a good comment. Not an increase. No, nope. not an increase. <laughs> and so this will be the third time we've had it now for almost 10 years. And it's definitely been, um, you know, needed. You know, when we've gone through some really challenging times. And um, so I hope that the voters will once again support it. Because it's critical to the functioning of our schools. Right. And we'll work hard to get the word out and make sure that our community understands the importance of this and with us being the, the larger district to uh, really take the lead on that. Mm -hmm. We always do. Yeah, say. <laughs> as Mike knows. I put some miles on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if there's no more discussion, then we'll move into a roll call vote. Okay. President Singer. Aye. Vice President Branstad. Aye. Treasurer Frizee. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. We have six yes votes for the record and one absent. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Now we'll move into item 3.6 for action. We have the 2018-19 school year calendar. Mr. Cheryl. So the, <coughs> as you may know, the school calendar is a negotiated um, item as it is a work condition for our employees um, with, our, with our teachers. And so we work through that each year. Um, relatively smooth pro process this year. Mr. Brutin and Mr. Cooper sat on that from, from the district representatives. And um, a few short meetings, we came up with two options of a school calendar. And uh, the employee, dis the district teachers voted on that. And you have the final option in front of you, which we, uh, we were OK with either option. A couple things for us that um, we always want to make sure we do well in there is PD. And um, we try to keep the half days down to a minimum for the benefit of our parents. So um, an, an additional change in that calendar would be spring break a week earlier 
that's been driven by state testing. Um, the feedback from our administrative group for a couple of years is they would prefer not to come back from spring break and go right into testing. And this would allow a one week buffer before the students would go into testing. And so we have that calendar in front of you. Um, some of those vacation dates, start dates are countywide set by us. And at this point, we still don't have a waiver, no, nor could we probably handle a waiver to start pre-Labor Day because of all of our construction work. We couldn't afford to lose a week of work, or else it would cost you significantly more funds. So we're looking for a motion for approval of the calendar. I move we approve item 3.6, which is the 2018-19 school, school year calendar. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Mary. All in favor? Wait, I, I have a question before okay so so just so I have an understanding what what did change because this seems like school is getting out a lot earlier than it has the last two years I mean I think that <coughs> there'll be a lot of people overjoyed when they see this but you know knowing the 180 days that really impacted a couple years ago us going so late is Brian, there anything significant that Brian and Bob can jump in here but it's predominantly PD and record okay. day driven okay yeah Mike that was entirely accurate it was the front loading of our PD more than we've ever done before. Okay. Uh, we have 12 hours of PD before school starts and historically okay. we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And that allowed us to move the start date to the first week of June where historically we've been in the second week of June. Right. Okay. Um, also with the reduction of half days that we have that afforded us the ability to make those changes as well. That's right, thank you. Because that's quite often a question that we get asked, you know, out in the community. Why is school going so late? Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor of item 3.6, aye? Aye. aye? aye. All opposed? And the ayes have it. <coughs> Moving into item 3.7 for action, we have two student expulsions. Ms. Gray? Yep, I bring um, a board subcommittee of three board members, uh, Superintendent Charles, myself, administrator, parents, and student met on February 13th at 2 o'clock. Um, for student A and at 2.30 for student B. Student A is being recommended for expulsion for the remainder of the 17-18 school year. It is the committee's recommendation that student A serve the expulsion. The student does have the opportunity to utilize the PASS program at the community center and actually is going to also the online learning through the PATHS program. Student A can um, apply for reinstatement over the summer for the start of the 18-19 school year and this action requires a roll call vote from the board. Okay, I'll accept the motion for item 3.7.1. Move to approve 3.71. Moved by McFarland, support by for Z. Okay. And any, any comments or questions? I'll, I'll just add a quick one for you. Um, so the laws changed and so you're seeing these more formally done in front of you as a board we bring it through the committee to get out the closed session um, because the personal identification of the student and the information is protected um, and then we bring it to the full board for your action it's it'll be the same if when they return they come back the petition that goes in front of a committee a little broader committee actually it's got required to have some parents and some other representatives on that committee they make a recommendation back to you to return them. So you're seeing a few more of these, but I must also say we are seeing a few more expulsions, um, particularly at the middle school levels. And that is probably going to drive us to look at um, maybe some more intervention style programs and see what's occurring while we're seeing these um, type of uh, issues occurring in, in the schools. Okay, next student B is also being recommended. Well, we we need to do the roll call. I'm roll call. I'm jumping all of your roll call there. They, is it a collective? Vote or no, no um, we, we got to do it each individually. individually. <coughs> okay. President Singer. Aye. Vice President Branset. Aye. Treasurer for Z. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. Six yes votes, one absent. Okay, thank you. Okay, student B is also being recommended for expulsion for the remainder of the 17-18 school year. It is the committee's recommendation that student B serve the expulsion. The student does the have, the have the opportunity to use online learning through the PASS program and additional instructional support. Student B can reapply for reinstatement over the summer for the start of the 18-19 school year. And this action also requires roll call. From the board. Okay, can I get a motion for? So moved. Support. Uh, any discussion? Okay. 
And we'll move into a roll call vote. Okay. President Singer. Aye. Vice President Branstad. Aye. Treasurer Frizee. Aye. Member Blazy. Aye. Member Friedel. Aye. I also vote yes. Six yes votes, one absent. Great, thank you. It's wonderful to have the PATHS program and the PASS program and online learning opportunities as well. Okay, now we will move into item 3.8 for action. We have copiers, printers across the district. Mr. Cooper. Yes, <clears throat> first item I do have for you are the copiers and printers across the district. I should say the long-awaited copiers and printers across the district. Everybody's been waiting for this. Uh, it's a rather complicated proposal, but it has 87 printers or copiers, uh, one and the same, that are manageable and have the ability to handle our faxing needs also. So manageable means, for example, um, you can put it in to be printed, but until you arrive at a machine, anyone in the district, it does not print. So it gives you that manageability to go to any one of many printers, and it's just waiting there for you to come in and, and ID your way in. Uh, we looked at it. It's really a five-year. That's very typical. Uh, we have leased in the past. We've talked to you about when the bond came that we'd, we would buy the devices. Uh, the complicated part always is it's really two parts always. There's the devices themselves. But the maintenance agreement really goes with it. Uh, and so you got to look at both. And you saw that in the bid tab. And of course, which products are offered and what their um, uh, maintenance looks like uh, requires quite a bit of truing things up so you're comparing uh, apples to apples. Uh, we are recommending that the technology team and the administration, the low bidder, Michigan Office Solutions, Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, uh, the five year cost, 884000 almost 885000 um, what I'm really looking for tonight is that first part, which is the devices which are paid for by the bond. That is $462,370. The um, maintenance agreement comes out of a uh, general fund. It's paid on an annual basis, and you can see that's $422,596.48, roughly $85,000 a year. Uh, they do estimate it. We give them those numbers to start with based on our previous history of, you know, how many copies we made over the last few years, and they use that as part of their bid when we go there. So what we're seeking at this time is the uh, approval to go with Michigan Office Solutions for $462,370 for the purchase of printer and copy replacements. Uh, Dave D. is here tonight if you have specific questions, but um, that's our proposal. Very good. I'll accept a motion for item 3.8. All right, I move we approve item 3.8, which is the purchase um, of printers and copiers. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Patrick. Is there any discussion? I guess, like Bob said, this has been on the agenda. A lot of discussions been around this for a, for a long time. So glad to see that we're to this point now. And it was low bid. It was low bid? Yeah. We went over to FFO. I know there was a bidder that uh, had a, a nice bid, but it didn't uh, meet all of our specs, so, so that didn't work out so well. Um, but this is also a provider that we're, we were using, so that... Uh, it's the one that we currently use and <coughs> had very good, especially on the maintenance side, because if you remember, that's been the bigger issue on the, the lease. We started with one company with the lease. They stepped in, uh, helped us tremendously on the lease, but their service part, which is important to us, mm -hmm. uh, they've been very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll uh, open it up for a vote. So all in favor of item 3.8, say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to 3.9. Mm -hmm kind of on a roll here. I got three of them, I think. Uh, 3.9 is the Woodcrest Makerspace Furniture Purchase. I know it's a little bit uh, like a broken record, but as we do the elementary schools, I've been coming to you with uh, usually first the, the cafeterias because they're the first things that get completed. We're going to try to get a little bit ahead of that because they've actually moved a little faster on some of those things, so some of the furniture there, but then we usually follow up the media center and then the makerspace. Um, even, it seems like we don't have a maker space at Woodcrest yet. If I don't order furniture now, uh, the wait time and the lead time on all this is, is, is relatively lengthy always. And especially when you get into summer when everyone else is ordering furniture, it even goes longer than that. So this would get it here uh, uh, on time for us to do this. 
Um, follows the same process we follow at other places. It's with uh, Great Lakes uh, Furniture Supply Company of Holland, Michigan. It's 33,607. Uh, almost exactly the same as the Plymouth one. It's slightly higher, a little bit to do with one extra storage unit, and um, I think it was four stools and one chair, if I remember <laughs> correctly. But it's close uh, how they are, so relatively close um, to that amount. And again, uh, very similar setups in all the buildings as far as what maker spaces are going to look like. So the, the furniture is coming in very much the same. Once in a while, there's a slight difference in just where that maker space is going to go. A little bit of the setup, so it can vary slightly, but that's where we stand. So, that's our recommendation um, for Woodcrest Makerspace. Great. Do I have a motion? I move to uh, approve item 3.9. Support. Moved by Mr. Prezi, support by Mr. McFarland. Um, is there any discussion? It's exciting to get that makerspace furniture. We've seen it several times now, and uh, it's very high quality, comfortable. Uh, it looks fabulous, so uh, I'm excited about that. I know Woodcrest will be excited as well. So we'll move into a vote. All in favor of item 3.9, say aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. 3.10. Um, we have for you something that doesn't come along very often, but it's the the high pool. Uh, they have to be resurfaced as part of the ongoing maintenance of a pool. Uh, the the Marseille you see there is really just the recoating the plastering of the pool. Um, and we did put that out to bid. Um, it, we are recommending that we go with advanced uh, pool services of Milford, Michigan for a total of, of 33000 um, If you looked at the bid tab on that one, they're quite a bit less than the other two. We did a lot of checking on references with, with that to make sure we're we're good and we feel comfortable there. Uh, we will work it in. I mentioned in there in July. As you know, we got a couple of things going on at Dow High, like a transformer. We got to get changed. And of course, their athletic teams don't want to be waiting around for us either. So, you know, nobody wants to pull down any time, but you have to empty the water out to recoat it. Uh, it's got to sit for a bit. So we're trying to squeeze it in there. So um, while you'll be approving this now, and we have to to get them on our schedule, the actual uh, cost will not go out until the next. Uh, the budget year. Okay. All right. So I move we approve item <laughs> three point ten, which is the Dow High pool repair. Support. Moved by Angela. Support by Mary. Is there any uh, discussion? Thanks for all your work vetting this company. Appreciate it. Is this just general fund money, or is it bond money? No, it'd be general fund. Okay. Okay. All right. Then we'll move into a vote. All in favor of item 3.10? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Item 3.11 for action, we have the 2017-18 budget adjustments by Mr. Cooper. Okay. As you know, um, every time during the course of the year, we start with the school budget that you adopt back in June. And as you know, school budgets are not um, advisory in nature. Like most people think of budgets, it's more just a reporting of where's our income coming from and how we're we using those, uh, that income uh, because they're public funds. And when either we get a change in the revenue coming in or expenditures going out, we make adjustments. So the typical pattern is about mid-year, which we're right about that point. Uh, we'll make an adjustment and then we'll do it again in June and I'll remind you when I get to the time frame how that works. So that we're just following a, a typical pattern there. There we go. All right, so I just want to remind you of the timeline because it sneaks up on us <coughs> real quick. And um, I think sometimes school budgets follow a calendar that seems a little strange because everything happens just a little earlier than you think it should, but it's what we have to do by state law. We're at our, uh, our mid-year budget revision right now. It's really just amending the budget. You're, you're not readopting it. You have a budget, you're just amending it on the changes that have happened. Wanted to remind you that uh, next uh, month on April 16th, uh, we do the workshop. Uh, really, I, it's a chance to kind of let you know um, what I know about the state funding and other factors that are going to affect that budget that I'm going to present to you in June. And that's typical, too. So sometimes we know quite a bit about the state. Sometimes we have our student enrollment. We know a little bit about medical. We can tell you some things about what employee costs are going to be and those kinds of things, and we do that at the budget workshop. 
Um, it's actually June 11th. Remember, you have two board meetings in June. Uh, the one on the 11th is when you get the uh, proposed 2018-19 uh, budget. And then when we follow up on June 25th, you're going to approve the final amendment to this year's budget. And then you're also going to adopt the 18-19 budget. And one of the reasons you have adjustments is for the very reason, as you guys know, when we put that budget together last June, when we started this one, we hadn't finished the audit. We were closing out accounts as we go. So there's always a budget variance at the end where we've asked everybody you're going to spend it if they are. And then when we get to the very end, they haven't spent as much, which, you know, it's just the timing of how that goes. And so the adjustment brings us back in line. All right, kind of major factors that affect the budget adjustments that I'm about to show you tonight. And these are typically things that they don't change much year to year. So I just wanted to show you. Student enrollment is always a big thing. Uh, Mike mentioned it earlier. Uh, when the enrollment stays up, it's a good thing because it is funded on a per pupil basis. So student enrollment, we budgeted for 7000 629 students based on our consultant and where he thought we should be. Uh, the blended account actually came in at 7689, uh, which is up 60 above the um, estimate that we had and what we started our budget with. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, we're not up 60 students, and I want to say that. We're up 60 from the budgeted number. Uh, I would guess we're within one or two of where we were last year, if not exactly dead on. Okay, so just so you take it that way. Um, another thing that happens is many times when we're doing everything in June, there's a lot of volatility and timing in that state funding. I can't tell you everything because it hasn't been decided. We're taking our best guess when we're there because you don't know what version is going to be there. Well, I would tell you that this year that wasn't true. I had a lot of information for you. Uh, the one thing that I didn't have as much, and you're going to see it here at adjustment time, is what I'd call either categorical or grant funding. Um, you just don't know. And so, for example, we got a STEM grant in the middle of all this. Or if you remember, we were talking a lot about 31A money, which we kind of knew was coming. We didn't know how much, so we didn't put it in the budget. Typically, grant and um, any categoricals have the same related expenditure as it does income. In other words, they're telling me what I can spend that on, and I have to spend it. Uh, sometimes I can use something called carryover on some things, which means the state does let you, or the federal government, carry over some funds. That plays a factor, too, because you never know that till the end of their fiscal year, which is a little bit different than, than ours. Um, so carryover can be a factor. Uh, look, revenue factors, um, it's getting much better with the PPT, but the PPT is so new. And if you know much about that personal property tax, it's on a phase-in process as to what you can claim as personal property taxes. So we're getting a better feel for what that means. Um, the state makes up what we lose in our hold harmless collection. Uh, other districts, if you had a bond before 2013, the state also helps you on, on making up that, but we're not in that, and anyone that got a bond after 2013 is. We're kind of unique in that we get it for our hold harmless millage. Um, we're, it's an it's interesting thing because it's one agency doling out that money. So far, we've gotten everything that we've ever missed. That's not a guarantee. I mean, that, that organization has X amount of dollars, and as long as they can fund us, they will, but I, I'm not here to tell you there's a day that that wouldn't happen. Um, we also have some developmental zones that sometimes play an interesting part, um, even confuse the city who puts them out there sometimes as to should they be collecting or do we have to refund that part back. They have things that are captured where they give us the actual money and we have to turn right around and pay it back to the, to the city. So that happens sometimes. Uh, we do have changes in special services, both on the revenue and expense side, including a funding we received through the ESA. Sometimes it's because the special services funding is based on the year before. So you're always going to have adjustments the following year one way or the other because they're using the year before to tell you how much funding you get in the current year. And of course, once they know where you ended up in the current year, they come back and make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And we do have budget variances. Um, I try to always be real conserva conservative and tell you the budget variance at the end is going to be 1%. Uh, I've seen it as high as 3 at the time I've been doing it. That's kind of rare. It usually kind of comes somewhere around 2, but I can't guarantee that. So uh, I'd much rather you make decisions based on a smaller variance. If it works out at the end, that's good. That can help you for the next budget. So try to do that as we go. Oops, there we go. So major revenue changes. And I listed a few more than I normally would. Just I wanted to show you the difference in grant funding here. The actual total revenue changes from when we had the original budget is uh, 3,260,950. When you look up there, I want to just point out one thing real quick on this in the next slide. Any of them that have a C at the end, 
means that it has a related expenditure going out the back side. Those are grants that are earmarked for something. But if you start from that very first amount that you see up there, state funding increases, it comes in different sections, but a lot of that's due to our additional 60 students that we didn't have. A little, some of it's BPT, but a lot of it is we had 60 more students that, that we got money for. Um, remember also, though, that sometimes that raise in state funding is a drop in local uh, because you only get to collect so much per student, and so they'll, they'll balance themselves off. MIPSERS is the teacher retirement system. Uh, a is um, basically used for um, uh, current costs that's given to the district to help offset so the fund only goes up so high percentage-wise. I'll give that to you. This year there was a part one and two. Uh, two was um, offsetting uh, the state retirement systems, resetting its, its uh, return rate that they're projecting. And so they added some funding to kind of hold districts harmless as they do that. Um, I think the feeling is generally that they projected a higher rate of return it needs to drop a percent. They're doing it over a couple years and they're kind of funding this so that we don't have to bear the burden of them shifting that rate of return that they expect. Uh, the other thing we didn't know uh, last uh, year was that they were going to give us some funding for high school students, which they did so much per student. You can see it there. Um, that's one. And I don't normally put the next one on their interest. Uh, much better, because typically the interest for the whole year hasn't amounted to, to, to uh, uh, anything. You know, it's three or 4000 and interest is just up. There was no way to predict that, but we're doing uh, a lot better even there. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, after that, uh, like the Section 24, uh, those are the kids that are court placed. Again, that's always based on the year before. So you see a negative there. That's the adjustment. If you have fewer kids in actuality, so they adjust it, it's always off a little bit. Uh, everything you see after that, the 147C is a rate cap. There's a part one and two there. If it comes in, it goes back out, but it's a pretty big chunk of money. Um, 31A risk, big federal grants. Don't forget on the federal grants, too, there's some carryover there. Uh, we got a little more money from the ESA in a transfer. Again, that's a, a restricted, so it's got to see after it. We, just, we went to the Great Start Readiness Program. Uh, we really didn't know much about that until October and November-ish, and so that's in there. Uh, we got the STEM grant um, that we put in for, for 89000 We had an early literacy grant a year ago, but it came in a little higher this year, and we had carryover. We didn't spend it all last year, so they let us carry that over. Um, we have IDA, if you remember, that's a federal mo money for special ed. And if you remember a year ago, we, we did talk to you a little bit about, um, we were providing some services for the parochials, which um, federally we should have had money passed through to us to do that. And now it's coming through to us to do that. Uh, the TRIG grants, a little bit of technology money that was, um, that was left. Uh, we didn't know if we have any of that this year. We thought we'd spend it all, but there's a little bit there. And the same with the adaptive test, which is the state gives. So again, 3.2, uh, 3.3 in, in revenue. We go to the expenses, certainly not as many, but still you can see that the total expenses, the net is uh, 2,184,525. Uh, 2, um, a couple of things that I'll point out to you. We have had, it's been an interesting year this way, but non-budgeted uh, expenses, as you remember, uh, the summer started with um, digging a lot of trenches out Dow High to find a power cord. And we've had a few things along the way that we just weren't, uh, not expenses that you would expect. We had the early flooding, which, um, you know, places covered, but we also, you know, whether it be a manhole or it be something else along the way, um, so we had some there. Um, that increased about 195. The nice thing there, well, nice or not, we were able to offset that because natural gas, we've uh, been getting some pretty good prices on that. And the same with fuel. So we have not had to, uh, you know, uh, earmark any extra money for that. We had 195, but we've offset that. While I'm at that, I want to mention to you that one other thing um, that, I, that I did at this budget adjustment time is um, I did do a transfer of money. We do have out there, and, and, and we've talked about it here, and you've actually approved it. We have a transformer that's going to be pretty costly. That high that's going to be done in July. So I have these costs coming up that we all know are going to come in July, next budget year. And so what I'm trying to do is I made a transfer to the Capital Improvement Fund. And that transfer then will cover those. So that now, and you'll see it doesn't really hurt where we're at, 
it puts that money aside so that we know the transformer is covered without having to take that out of what would be back what would be considered the general fund. So I'm transferring over uh, PRME is what we used to call it, but it's the capital improvement fund that's there. There's that. The pool will actually shift over there. It's coming from here mm -hmm. into that one. I'd like to do the radios that way. Remember, we talked a lot about the radios. Of course, when we get into it, the state police don't have their grant anymore, of course, mm -hmm. or timing, <laughs> I guess. But uh, this way, we'll, I put enough money over that will help us maybe do all the radios at one time so we're not dragging it out uh, over time to try to afford that. And also, as you know, we've been doing some work at Carpenter, and some of that work will go over into the next one. So. There is a transfer in there. It wouldn't show up in the uh, expenditures, but transfer to side so we, we have some of that money in the capital improvement fund. Um, like I told you, most of what you're going to see under the expense side all has letter C in it, which you can tie right back to the revenue that I showed you. It came in and has to go back out the other way. Um, we, I don't want to make it sound like they tell us exactly what to do. Um, Brian had to sit down with the 31A at risk money, uh, come up with how we want to spend it, but there are some restrictions on where you spend grant money at. And it has to be used in certain ways. Uh, but you get an idea of how the money's going back out the other way, all the way through. So again, take you to the general fund snapshot then. So the first column that you see is our original budget in June. All right, so the first thing that you're seeing is, is where we were when we adopted 1718. Now, the one thing I want to point out about that, and I'll get to the column, second column of this in red, the one thing I want to point out about it is that, remember, that what you approved in 1718 was before the audit came in, right? So some people glance right away and say, oh, you were at 17%. If you notice the bottom, you want to know what your fund balance is, percent of expenditures, and it's jumped to 20.7. Well, in actuality, when the audit came in, we had much bigger variance than we thought. So where we started off in June um, expecting it to be about 11.6 million, starting point was really 13.8. So you had a head start at 2.3 million. The fund balance was that much higher when we started. Never gets reflected till now. So I just want you to know that, that part of that is when that audit comes in, you had a little better fund balance. You'll see if you add on that 3,260,000, uh, you're around 82.4 uh, million for revenues about 80.4 for the new expenditures. And again, you can see those amounts out there. So that, of course, if you subtract those two, your surplus is going to be up about 1.9, just shy of two, 2 million there. Um, we hope to have a budget variance. I did it 1% of expenditures. Um, could be higher, it just depends. But we're gonna be conservative on that estimate. So you can see our surplus uh, will be um, 2.7, uh, really about 2.8 million. And you can kind of see where we're anticipating, at least right now with the March budget, uh, where we'll be, and that, that is 20.7% of our expenditures. A couple of things to caution you on there. That's 20.7% of all our fund balance that way. Don't forget that there are monies placed in the fund balance. One of two things. We have restricted <coughs> it in the sense of it was given to us to use for specific purposes. We cannot <coughs> use it for anything except, in this case, STEM is the biggest part of it. You've also, not that we can't use it, but you've also siloed some money. Um, you've, you've just reserved it. And you did that. We started last year, we talked about it on printers, for example. Um, and we put a little bit of money aside so that if you do this right over five years, if you didn't have a bond to come back to and you needed to get the printers next time, you'd have some money set aside. Doesn't mean you can't spend it for other things, but you've kind of set it aside, just reserved it a little bit there. So I would take a guess at the unrestricted fund balance being uh, more in the range of 19 point something there. So it's, it's more like you, uh, at least a percent less than that. Uh, when you look ahead, um, again, um, and we, we'll talk again when we um, talk for the new budget and finishing up this budget, it's the same thing. We do have our balance, our budget process. Wanted you to know we already started. We meet with every building. Um, we've done elementaries, except for maybe one. We've done the middle schools. We do high schools this week and the other elementary. And we do all the big departments. And we have them come in and talk about how they would like to see their money spent. And we try to put a big picture together and share that with the agenda team and eventually uh, back it's uh, we've been holding them pretty steady so there hasn't been a whole lot to talk about because we've kind of held them where they're at um, as you know the vast majority of our expenditures are always in personnel we're a personnel mm -hmm. heavy 
uh, business. That's what we do. Um, student enrollment, uh, we do not have any consultant numbers back yet, but it's always a biggie when you look at budgets. Uh, what do we expect? Are we going to stay the same? We're going to lose some kids. State funding, um, you always hear the governors first, and lately it's been the most uh, uh, joyous, uh, you know, the best one. By the time the House and Senate get done, it changes. Mm -hmm. um, for us, it just depends on they can take money from the foundation allowance and move it over to categorical. It can be a bad thing for us sometimes because they can make the foundation allowance go up, but then the categoricals take it away another place. So mm -hmm. it looks like you're getting more per student by the time you work it out, you're not. Or it could come out really well. So it's always hard to know. Governor's the only one out there so far, but it shouldn't be too long before at least the House, the Senate, one of them releases their version, and then of course it's got to go back into committee, and they have to work out that different parts that they accept. Mm -hmm. um, so the other part, personnel costs. Uh, our staffing levels make a difference, the salaries. Um, we do know that a lot of our salaries, in fact, the vast majority, are tied into the fund balance, the way it's trending. Uh, I'll be able to tell you at the budget adjustment where we think that's going to come at, which should be the, the higher level that we talked with each group. So that's a very good thing for the people that have worked very hard for us. Um, categories, you know, when people are making steps again because they were froze or switching lanes, as we call it, when they've added degrees, um, those things make a difference. Our retirement and what the state does there, if they ever took away the 147 money, that would be a bit of a troublesome thing. Um, same with medical. We've had a long run with medical. Uh, with Mesa, it's been 18 months. Uh, we will have, in the middle of this next budget year, a change of some kind. Uh, the question is, is it an 18 months worth of buildup and you know, half the year we're going to get a, a higher raise? Hard to know, so we'll talk about that. Uh, the, Mesa, uh, the, excuse me, the ESA transfers, there's Act 18. Medicaid, and even the enhancement millage. Uh, Mike's exactly right on that. If that was not there, um, that's a pretty big chunk of money that would really have an effect on our budget. We'd have to sit there. And of course, the available fund balance. Um, it's, it was very good to us and got us through the lean years. Um, I think we're doing a good job getting it built back up. Um, you, you don't just keep building forever, but by the same token, um, you, you got to remember that there's a reason for putting that together and, and having it there so that you can get through the times that aren't so good. And I just, honestly, the state funding, everybody thinks it could be not too bad a year this year. Um, a lot of stories out there that after this year, um, which has to be an election year, um, after this year might not be so good. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, like always, what we need you to do at amendment time is just to take a vote. It doesn't have to be a roll call vote, just to amend uh, your adopted budget with the changes that I showed you in revenue and expenditures. Uh, we do always make it available online, um, and it also has a spot on our transparency website. Every time you make an amendment, uh, that goes on there too. So, if I had to answer any questions, or um, you can go ahead and, and make a, a motion to, to amend that budget. We'll do the motion, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. So, I'd entertain a motion. I move we approve item 3.11, which is the 2017-18 budget adjustment. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Patrick. And we'll open it up to questions or comments. Bob lulled you to sleep with numbers. Come on now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do just want to say, I mean, it is, it is very evident how important our student headcount is. So many numbers are factored into that. So all of the things that we continue to do to try to make sure that our district is a district of choice um, is working, is evidenced by our um, study. Three positive motions in budgets, school budgets when you build them, <coughs> and it's FTE, but mm -hmm. it's also um, a number of employees, FTE the other way, number of employees you, you the third factor is always um, things like bonds, which allow you to not purchase through there. Right. But Bob, caution you very much so that um, uh, lien payments are coming. Um, there's, there's no doubt when you talk to legislators that uh, the school aid fund will stay healthy, but the general fund will not um, due to some of the tax breaks and different things they've done. Um, and so those are coming. Don't expect the school aid fund to continue to carry you. In fact, this year when the governor announced 122.40, I've already heard 100 at best. Um, for us, uh, um, districts who receive the lower amount. 
So um, even this year, it'll be a nice amount, but it won't be what you, certainly what we were thinking going forward. And then certainly with the bond funds, we have to plan for the day that they're no longer here, and we have lots of capital improvement projects beyond that as well. And so there's employee compensation, there's new programming, and there's taking care of your facilities that should come out of a general fund instead of always doing it the way we've uh, been doing it lately, which is a, a, a through a bond. That capital fund is so important to us, and uh, it's important that we put that money away for things like the transformer issue we had at Dow, and we just never know what's going to happen. So uh, I think that's very important. And then as the other thing you mentioned, uh, siloing money and, and putting it aside for things like printers in the future, I think that's a, a smart uh, move, and, and we need to be cognizant of, of what is going to come at us in the future, and I think that's a good way for us to, to plan for the future and make sure we have that money there so uh, we can deal with those um, issues when they, come, when they come to us. If I could also, I, I, it would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, one of the reasons you have a big variance is because I think everybody in the district takes that seriously. So mm -hmm. you would not have a variance right. at the end if people were just spending to say, hey, I got that much money, I got to get rid of it. Um, that means every employee is uh, kind of doing their part. I guess I also would want to thank the business office, Lori Holderby and stuff there. They really keep track of, of all the details. It's uh, I got the easy part presenting it. Um, uh, they're the ones that are back there with the auditors and everybody working out the fine details. So I just didn't want to forget the people that have helped us in the process to get to where we are. I appreciate the uh, interest in your slide presentation and to see such a, a nice uh, large number there for interest, and that means um, someone's really focusing on making the most of our investment in our money. Uh, also, the natural gas uh, is, a, is a plus. I know we can't count on that every year, but it sure has. Um... Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but natural gas prices have really helped us out, and we can't count on that in the future, but uh, it sure has been nice this year. So I have fuel, diesel, and fuel, gas. Yeah. I've made a difference. Okay, we burn a lot of diesel, so make sure you include that in there. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of item 3.11, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimous. All right, now we are moving into item four, which is rec <coughs> request to address the board, and I believe we have a few people here tonight. Um, if, if when you come up, you could state your name and address and let us know. Um, well, the first one's Patty. She's not local. I don't think you are, Patty. No. Correct me if I'm wrong. So she's here for a little different purpose, so you don't have to do that. There you go. I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> yeah. I can either okay. use my big voice <laughs> or I can try to do it this way. Um, all that budget talk. Oh, let's talk about something that's free. <laughs> free. Free. That's the big word that you need to take away from this my little uh, presentation tonight. Free, fast, effective, confidential, and neutral are the five things of the Michigan Special Education Mediation Program. I am one of four outreach representatives in the state, and my area covers from Grand Rapids to Traverse City to Alpena, back through uh, Saginaw, the whole thumb, and back across over to Lansing. So you are in my area, you lucky people. <laughs> um, I want to start at the beginning and go real quickly there's a lot of information and I'll make the invitation now at the start I would love to come back and give you the full presentation if you feel that it's worthy and I would also invite the audience I have put brochures out in the hall you can find us on the web look up Michigan special education mediation and you can find us there and I would love to come to speak to any organization that feels that it's worthy so IDEA was passed in the 60s, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. In that federal act, there is a passage. Of
to try a mic? Okay. <laughs> you won't be on television. Here, just I, I guess just promise me to top, stop my timer. If <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Mine. Okay. Off the side. You can hold it or clip it onto your shirt. Of course. I think it's mine. Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. My name is Deborah Mead. My address is 801 East Wheeler Road, Midland, Michigan. Uh, my husband and I, Alan and I, were both born and raised in Midland. Uh, we have two sons. Sean is 10. He has autism and has received support from the ESA since age two. Um, MPS and ESA would both call him an ESA student, but I call an M him an MPS student who receives support from the ESA. He's currently transitioning to officially becoming an MPS student with special ed services. Our son Jacob is eight. He attends general ed with an IEP and receives the um, MPS special ed support services of a full-time para and speech therapy. As a parent, I know there are many behind the scenes details that go into running a school system and it's a very complex job with many considerations. I feel that MPS and ESA do a lot of things correctly. I've worked with many supportive and caring people from both organizations that go seriously above and beyond every day supporting our kids. Uh, along with all that I love, there is room for improvement with both MPS and ESA, and especially in the manner that they work together. Um, I attended the MPS communication meeting. Um, I met with Mike Sharo and Janet and Laurel Bucci from the Arc of Midland on March 16th to discuss the realignment plan that they have, um, that MPS has, as well as the changes that are needed to successfully support kids with autism in our school system and other special needs also. I'm very appreciative of their time. Uh, thank you, Mike, for meeting with me and Janet. Um, I, um, so we talked about where we are and some proposed solutions and I wanted to share that with the board, all of you. Um, so one support issue, para availability. The pool of MPS paras is too small. Um, Mike, um, at all, I say at all because I know the ESA and Midland Public Schools and many people are working on this. They um, are proposing to raise the pay rate of paras which will hopefully widen the pool. Mike Sharo's proposed solution for para training, because MPS tra paras do not have the enough training to effectively do their jobs supporting kids with autism, and I have many examples here that you can read at your leisure. Um, he proposes, along with the other people, to commit MPS financial resources to professional development and training of MPS paras, specifically in autism. And um, another solution would be the MPS will commit funds to hire ESA paras on a short-term basis for high-risk time such as transition periods. Uh, from a parent perspective, it would be best to have these um, consistent, well-trained ESA paras long-term, but I don't know if that's feasible. Um, another para problem is communication to paras by the Midland Public Schools. Um, standard procedure where MPS paras are given a child to work with with no information about the child whatsoever short of their name. I can verify this with my son Jacob. It has happened repeatedly. Uh, these, my proposed solution, because Mike and I didn't have time to talk about this, is to um, give for the Midland Public Schools to give the para prior information before that child they meet that child, such as also you know, an overview of the special needs, strategies to support them, and a questionnaire from the parents about getting to know your child. Um, so let's see, and MPS communication to parents regarding paras, they, um, the, you know, if a para doesn't show up, they call in sick, MPS does not inform the parents. I get a note at the end of the day um, in my son's backpack saying, well, his para didn't show up, we couldn't find a sub, so he went all day without a para. Luckily, he did okay. Did okay. But that's definitely not going to work with my son, Sean, when he trans transitions to Midland Public Schools, so I'm looking for more communication there. Um, there's lack of an autism support resource for MPS, special ed kids. Um, with autism and so um, Mike et al. proposed hiring for the start of next school year an autism specialist uh, which is re-hiring re you know Gabe Hatfield's old position um, and then 
a lack of communication and cooperation between Midland Public Schools and the ESA re with reference to the MPS facility usage analysis. Um, a proposed solution is that because these affect ESA programs, um, that during the usage analysis, the ESA will be consulted and parents will be able to give input either directly or through the ESA before final decisions are made. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but if you could please read through the rest of this information, I would really appreciate it. Um, there, I really spent hours and days <laughs> thinking this, rethinking it, trying to write it in a way that I feel fully supports our viewpoint for on several levels. Um, so, and also if the um, school board could please um, um, get back to me on the points where I mentioned, do Mike and the school board stand behind this, these proposals? If you could please respond to me, you know, at your earliest convenience after you've had a chance to review them, I really appreciate that. Thank you for your time today and um, to listening to this discussion of ways in which Midland Public Schools and the ESA work together to support special needs children. Thank you. And now we have um, another, pres uh, another person who would like to request the board. I have Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. Joe, if you could state your name and your address, and then we'll set the clock at five minutes for you. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. It is. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Johnson. My address is 2916 Riggy Street, Midland, Michigan. Um, I want to say uh, good evening, and thank you for allowing me the time to speak here tonight. Um, my wife and I, uh, Lynn, uh, have a student affected by the moving of the ASD classroom to from Central Park to Chestnut Hill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in the MPS communication, it shows that the ASD program C is moving from Central Park with an additional behavior room that is pending staffing and numbers taking its place. My child has attended what I consider to be the typical classroom environments and while Chestnut Hill has a great history, and I'm sure it is a fine school, it cannot, in my mind, provide the least restrictive environment and inc inclusion uh, provided to my child at Central Park. Midland Public School is attempting to put a large focus on keeping my child with his peers through middle and high school, and I certainly can appreciate that. Unfortunately, this does not take into account the peers living in his neighborhood, his local groups and clubs, or attending the same school that his sibling will attend. My child needs to start being viewed and treated like an MPS student that receives ESA support. Maybe that would help ASD children keep a more consistent environment instead of being looked at like they are not our kids, which may make the decision to move them easier. Instead of the ASD classroom at Central Park being viewed as a problem, it should be viewed as a wonderful opportunity for Midland Public Schools to showcase how great children with autism are doing in the environment that MPS created. Now, I can't guarantee that the publicity on this will result in more or larger donations and increased participation in fundraising events or other monetary gains, but it certainly will not hurt. I would like to ask or suggest that the ASD classroom remain at Central Park for a minimum of another school year. This will allow for time for Midland Public Schools to get a better picture of how this model truly helps children with ASD achieve higher inclusion levels, increased social interactions, and greater academic success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And now uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Navia to chair? <laughs> Neva Sherhart, thank you. Yeah, why don't you come in the front? Because you don't have to get back there. That way everybody can see you're pretty, pretty dressed and your pretty face. My name is Neva Sherhart, and I go to Central Park, and I'm in Sean's class. Sean is autistic, but that's not all that he is. Sean and I have known each other since second grade, and he has made a lot of progress since the previous years. Before, everybody ignored him, and he wasn't in class much. Now, almost everybody eats lunch with him and plays at recess with him. He stays involved in almost all of our activities. He never used to be able to do that. I have a very cool thing I get to do with Sean. It is called Six Minute Solution, and I also get to do peer group. Peer group is where we play games that help Sean communicate and be social with other students. I think it is fun, and I think Sean likes it too. So, Sean also has a zone sheet. The zones are green, blue, yellow, orange, red, and purple. I have not seen Sean be in any other zone except green, which is amazing. Honestly, he has taught me so much. I even asked about two questions on my math, math worksheet. The, question, the questions were what is a 12-sided polygon called? What is a 10-sided polygon called? He instantly said a dodecagon and a decagon. I was so amazed. I don't know what I would do without Sean. I think that Central Park wouldn't be the place it is without kids that think like Sean. I was told that Sean gets to stay through a different program. I think Sean is strong enough to do it, but I worry other kids who I don't know won't be able to. I'm here on behalf of not just Sean, but all the kids but all Central Park kids. I once read a book called Separate is Never Equal. I think this is a perfect title for this situation. If they are all in our school, they should be able to stay. If all kids aren't welcome to stay as Central Park Explorers, then I don't want to stay either. Okay, thank you. You did a wonderful job speaking. Thank you for coming. And now, um, Kiana Crow. Did I pronounce that right? Kiana. Kiana, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kiana Crow. I am in Sean's fourth grade class. I know that I have not known Sean that long, but since the beginning of the year. Sean has improved so much. Sean is an awesome, talented, and handsome young man. Something else I think is cool about Sean and how he improved from the beginning of the year is Sean, is last year Sean did not talk to people that much. Now Sean sits with his friends at lunch and he also hangs out with his friends during lunch, recess, and during breaks we have in the classroom. Something else I think is cool is I get to walk down with Sean to specials. I don't think this move is a good one because these kids have a routine that they have gotten used to. But if you take them away from the routine, it will take a lot to have these kids get used to the new routine. Not only does the not only does the public schools help Sean learn, he also helps us learn. Central Park is a, Central Park is a place where we accept everyone. Why should we be separated? Michelle. Thank you for coming and, and supporting your friend. You did a wonderful job. Do we have any other uh, folks that would like to address the board at this time? OK, seeing none, then we will move into item, item five, curriculum instruction and assessment. It looks like. Uh, Item 5.1, we had minutes from February 20th. <coughs> Ms. Fidel, are you going to? OK. We met on Tuesday. Excuse me. Um, we met on Tuesday, February 20th um, at uh, Plymouth School. 
Um, or we had an overview of the history and future plan for early childhood education were provided for the group. Current MPS offerings include the tuition-based four-year-old program at Adams and the income-based Great Start Readiness program at Plymouth. The current preschool program and Young Fives classes will be moved to Carpenter Street Elementary for the 2018-19 school year. The new venue will provide the opportunity to uh, alleviate space issues in our current elementary schools, allow MPS to expand offering. Uh, the offering of a three-year-old program is being explored and afford for staffing synergies. The informational session was followed by a tour of the Great Start uh, Readiness Program lo located in Plymouth, and we also got to tour uh, the facility expansion and renovations um, concluding, uh, that concluded this session. Uh, we had a meeting today. Our next meeting uh, is scheduled for March 19th. How did it look over there? Nice, <coughs> nice. And the, the, the kids were just getting up from the nap when we went to, uh, went to visit. Uh, and uh, they, they have their own activities and uh, they, it, it, it was just a, a, a nice environment for the kids. But I'm uh, happy to know that we're going to have a multitude of kids gathering in the same general space so that um, the teachers will be able to work together and interact with one another. And um, the playground equipment will be appropriate for the kids that are there. So it's a, it's a nice offering. I hope that there are people out there that are willing to consider that and look more in, into it in more detail. Great, great. Thanks for representing us there. Okay, we will move into uh, item 6.1. We have finance facilities and operations, minutes from March 5th. Yep, we met as a committee March 5th. Um, guests were Mr. Daryl Dumbro, Dale Jerome, Mike Mogelberg, the Director of Facilities and Operations. Uh, talked about a few topics. First was HVAC system controls. Uh, Mr. Mogelberg demonstrated the HVAC computerized controls that he's able to monitor and control remotely. The new controls and computer software have been installed as part of the bond work being done across the district. Um, the bond update from Mr. Dumbro shared a first look at the 2019 projects and a possible design bid schedule. <coughs> Series 2 of the bonds will be sold in 2019 and priorities are being examined as we finish major work on the elementary buildings. We move to secondary building bond work. The committee also briefly looked at some contingency analysis. Uh, Mr. Cooper gave us a Hey, um, I'm sorry, I lost my spot here. Mr. Cooper, Mr. Sher reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee. One, the March budget adjustment. Two, the award of the bid for the purchase and service of printers and copiers. Three, award of the bid for the HH Dow pool recoding. And four, the purchase of furniture for the Woodcrest Maker Space, all of which we discussed tonight uh, earlier. Next meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 9th at 5 o'clock. Great. Thank you, Patrick. And then move in for information, we have gifts. Yeah, we have, if uh, you look at that list, over 30 uh, tonight uh, for $50,914.02. I uh, don't want to mention any, just to not miss anybody, but you will notice the both athletic booster clubs for both schools uh, pretty heavy on this one. Uh, so is the Jefferson uh, Parent Advisory Committee. Uh, some of the nonviolence uh, and the snow sculpture do in the Community Foundation, and then the ones that you see from Dow Chemical Foundation Donor Advisory Fund. Hopefully, I get this right. These two will correct if I don't, but it's the We Movement, the We Innovation is what it was. And so, we had teachers that applied, and you can see there's a, uh, some, some economic games and some mentoring programs, and little robots, and uh, outdoor learning space they're looking at. Um, so, all those items are there. I do have um, actually four items, though, because of their total uh, that require your action, the amount of money there are. We have, uh, again, the uh, innovation, uh, the We Innovation Grant for the Go Green Club at Dow. So there's 5000 there. The Dow's Music Boosters has a $5,000 gift. And then Midland High Athletics Boosters, uh, two different things. They, they have 10000 for track and field equipment. I think it's a pole vault, if I remember correctly. Look at these, and I think that's what that one was. And then uh, 15,000 
320 for football uniforms. And 6-3 does require your action because of the amount of money for the gifts. Okay, I'll accept a motion for item 6.3. I move support for item 6.3, gifts totaling $35,320.20. Support. Moved by Angela, support by Mary. All in favor, say aye. Discussion. Oh, discuss. Would anyone like to discuss? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I, yesterday I attended the open house at Dow High for their 50th uh, anniversary and the and the go green club was there and um, uh, they have a Facebook page but um, they are putting using the money to build a greenhouse at Dow High oh, great. Um, and they have uh, recycling initiatives um, it's just really a cool club organization and the kids were the ones that were all about writing for this grant so it was pretty neat Any other comments? 5,000 for transportation music will be wonderful for the students. And um, I, I really appreciate the booster clubs taking such an active role over there at Midland High and um, donating 10,000 to track and field and, and then the 15,000 for uniforms. They started doing that uh, several years ago and, and it's been great for, for the sports teams over there. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of accepting item 6.3, say aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimous. Moving into human resources. <coughs> uh, J Janet, do you have this one? Item 7.1. Um, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathies to these families. Mr. Roy Wise, who passed away on February 12, 2018. Mr. Wise was a business education teacher department head and co-op coordinator. During his 23 years with MPS, he worked at both Midland and H.H. Dow High Schools, retiring in 1993. Mrs. Helen Zonlack, who passed away on March 6. Mrs. Zonlack was a kitchen assistant in the MPS food service department for 18 years, retiring in 1987. The following staff members announced their retirement effective this year on these dates. Dixie Dent, bus driver, transportation department, June 14th. Terry DeLude, teacher, Chestnut Hill, June 15. Kay Emmons, prior professional, Chestnut Hill, June 14. Myself, Janet Greif, administrator, <laughs> August 31st. Um, Bridget Hockemeyer, principal, Central Park Elementary, June 30. Jolene Lutz, office professional, administration center, June 29th. Mary Larson, teacher, Chestnut Hill, June 15. Rhonda, Le Rhonda Leisure, teacher, Chestnut Hill, June 15. Marty Legg, Teacher Woodcrest, June 15. Will Lazar, Teacher Midland High, June 15. Michelle Dodge Meitler, Teacher Northeast, June 15. Nancy Metz, Teacher Woodcrest, June 15. Judy Mor Moran, Teacher Jefferson, June 15. Lori Murphy, Teacher Northeast, June 15. Mark Pickering, Teacher H.H. Dow, June 15. Amy Slayball, Teacher Plymouth, June 15. Colleen Smith, Teacher Chestnut Hill, June 15. Kareen Thompson, Teacher H.H. Dow, June 15. Lynn Tolfa, Teacher Woodcrest, June 15. Bernadette Wood, Teacher Northeast, June 15. And Brian Zimmerman, Social Worker of Special, Works with Special Services on June 30th, 2018. So there's quite a few people in the retirement. Very good, thank you. This year. Wish them well. Thank them for all their years of service. There's a lot of, if we added up those years of service, that's yeah. a lot of people who've been here a long time. Yes. I'm sure at the Gerstecker Awards, we will add that up. We will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, item eight, we have correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Uh, letters will go out. Uh, item nine, we have schedule activities for information. You can see that our next meeting, we will have a budget workshop at 6.30 and our regular meeting at seven o'clock. And now I'll open up uh, to study discussion. Uh, Patrick, how would I start with you? All right, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of items to discuss that we're grateful for tonight. I'll just hit on a couple. Um, I don't think I'll get them all, but I'm sure everybody will get it here at some point. But congrats to Midla High and the award. Always nice to see mm -hmm. her students and staff awarded for the hard work they put in. 
Um, throughout the Dell High presentation, uh, what struck me the most is just to see the enthusiasm and excitement of the students talking about what they enjoy doing, how they've found possible career tracks. It's always nice to see. Um, you, really, you can't fake that kind of enthusiasm. Um, I wish I had that myself sometimes on a daily basis going to work, so happy for the students. Um, reminder that the millage we discussed tonight is in fact a renewal and not a new not a new uh, not a new bill or a new tax but a, a uh, renewal and it will I believe help to improve safety going forward from what we're already doing additionally um, I think other than that my last thing for me was this is my fourth year as of being elected on this board and I have decided to re to re rerun for election this year so I will be You'll see me on the ballot in November. Great. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, just a congratulations to Midland High School for their Education Excellence Award for the Chemic Challenge. Uh, also, congratulations to our Shining Stars. Um, also, was able to attend the Booster Bash Saturday night. It was well attended. Uh, thanks for everybody that came and supported uh, athletics for both of our high schools. Um, it's great to see. and. Please continue to support them. I know that money goes a long way. They, they do lots of wonderful things with uh, the Booster Bash. Congratulations to Dow High for 50 years. That is, that is exciting. Um, really happy to see the Dow High uh, Beginning Journalism update, update online in your book group. Very impressive. Um, their enthusiasm, their communication skills. Um, they might have been shy before, but they're not now. <laughs> um, Bob did mention that the radio grant for the state police is, is gone. Uh, I would just encourage that we look at other avenues. Maybe there's something else out there that we can look to to keep moving that forward to finish off our buses and our antenna and repeater and it's big, big dollars. And I'd like to, I know you guys have heard me talk about it before, I'd like to finish that one. Um, I'd also like to thank the people from the public that came out tonight, Deborah, Joe, Neva, and Kiana. Appreciate that. And congratulations to all the middle public school retirees. Thank you. It was nice to, to see everybody come out tonight and express their opinions. Um, a lot of times folks who complain never express their, companion, their opinions and, and people who want change never speak up. So for them to come out here and and exercise their right to do so I thought was was great and um, you know they had a lot of good points and and um, you know, Deborah gave us uh, a pretty comprehensive <coughs> to review and, and definitely some stuff to think about moving forward uh, so it was good it was good that they came out to do that um, the journalism presentation I thought was interesting and Ben um, made a comment I don't know if he really thought about it a lot it was kind of an off-the-cuff but he said, you know, nobody thinks about behind the scenes when he was referring to the janitors. And for me, as it applies to the journalism piece, I never thought about behind the scenes. It was just kind of something, you know, we get the, the update and, and the other um, publications and never really think about all the work that goes into them. And it was really, I guess, enlightening to see everything that goes on and how in-depth uh, that process is. Uh, so. Those are just a couple highlights. It was good to see the fund balance is, is healthy, but obviously um, cautiously optimistic with that. Um, so overall, I thought it was a, it was a great meeting, and um, that's all. I um, have to agree with what's said. Um, I just wanted to um, mention again that, that Fragments magazine that the Dow uh, High puts out, I was just amazed at some of the poetry that comes from those kids that you might at least I had some of them as students and it was like oh my gosh I didn't even know that he had that in him you know I just saw the chemistry side so it was really really cool to um, see these kids that are artists and, and poets and and um, can write such great work um, published like that so that's just an extra piece that they do and I know they've won a lot of awards and um, Cami is just awesome uh, the, the amount of time that she puts in uh, beyond the regular school day with those kids. So hats off to her. And lots of retirees. Oh my gosh. Um, some real tough slots to, to replace. But uh, welcome to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me when you say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> That's got a few more years to go. Yeah. So, all right. Um, let's see. You 
spoke on the booster bash. Glad you got to go. We had tickets, but we had to celebrate my, well, I shouldn't say have to. We chose to celebrate my son's birthday in Ann Arbor with him instead. Um, congratulations to Dow on their 50th anniversary. Um, really enjoyed the award for the Comic Challenge. So glad to see that because I was so impressed um, back, when did they say they were here? September? September. When they um, presented. Just what an amazing group of teachers that have put this together and just a great opportunity for students. Um, glad to see that that will continue and move forward. And then very much enjoyed the um, Dow High presentation. Maggie has been a friend of my daughter since they were little and it's just, it's so exciting to see these kids as they grow up and mature and turning into these adults and just so well spoken, all three of them. And, um, and then also, yeah, Cami, and that's why I brought up the point, because I've known just from my kids being friends with kids on that paper how much extra time they put in, the late, late nights and everything. And, um, and it is, it's great to um, read the papers. We love the papers from both of the um, schools. Um, in case anyone else is uh, wondering, my daughter informed me yesterday on the 18th of March that that would be exactly two months until the seniors are done. So <laughs> I, I, it, the date didn't mean anything to me, it did to her. So um, hang in there, seniors, two more months. And um, thank you for your willingness to serve again. Yes. I know the next question, I know I'm up for re-election this year too, and I, I will say that I am still considering it. So um, the last, I think this is my seventh year, we have been through a lot of tough times, and I'm really excited about what we have done and where we are going now. And so. Um, looking forward to seeing um, over the next few years as we continue to um, expand our opportunities and use our bond funds. So I am seriously considering. Great. But I will let you all know when I decide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Yep. That would be great news. Yeah. Uh, so that would, that's wonderful. Well, you know, I mean, I, I ran because of what this district has done for my children, and I still feel that way. I ran when they were younger and already, and now that they are, you know, my last one's graduating, I just, this district has so much to offer for kids, and I've so, been so proud to be a part of the board um, to be able to help that along. Absolutely. Thank you for your leadership in that. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, the budget workshop uh, next month, and uh, right after after <laughs> yeah. spring break, so we can <laughs> so we can uh, have a nice restful spring break, and everyone can be safe. Uh, I too went to the booster bash, and that was a, a great event. I I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I'm also uh, looking forward to helping work on the regional enhancement and getting the word out, and we'll. Uh, We'll have to work together uh, as a board and support Mike in, in making sure we get uh, those positive messages out to our community so they know how important it is to uh, all of our districts. I too will be running for re-election this year, so uh, um, I, I sure have enjoyed my time on the board and am passionate about kids and have been for a long time. And I'm, I'm very thankful for this board and the, and the direction and the support um, that we've been able to move together to get things done. And uh, it's not always you have a strong board that you can move together to get things done, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I also am thrilled with all of the uh, bond work that has gotten done. And um, so many improvements and just positive comments in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I appreciate, Mike, your, your uh, communique and um, details to what's going on. And I know our community is looking uh, even for more. So, and I know you're working on that. So I appreciate that. And um, I think we, we are uh, going in a, in a wonderful direction. And I thank you for your leadership with that, that bond and um, following that through. That's all I have. Well, off that note. I do think we're heading in an incredible direction. And I, I don't like to say this, but I've been doing this a long time. And um, this week, I'm a bit upset on a posting that's out on the internet saying that we are not doing a good job, you or I, on the bond issue. And so I'd like to address some of those facts. And I'm going to bring more information forward to back those facts up because um, I think it's borderline, borderline to the point where we may, may consider legal action if you guys would like on some of this stuff because it's very slanderous out there to me. 
Um, the post states that we're not completing our bond work list, which is not the case at all. In fact, it's, it's incredible that we are completing the amount of work that we're doing and the additional work we're doing with rising bond costs. I sent you an article. It's not just us. It's statewide. School bond issues have taken hit because of a recovering economy where the contracted prices aren't nearly as competitive as they were. Um, goods are going to go up. Goods have gone up. Get ready for aluminum, guys. Aluminum's going to go up. These are going to be ongoing issues that we need to be creative and, and work through as we go forward. That's why bonds are flexible. That's why bond language is approved, and that allows flexibility to do so. Um, the post admits, admits many facts that are needed for background information. And being a good Catholic boy, I call it lying by omission, omission of facts, very easily. The post represents post bid number six, which includes work at Seabird and Chestnut Hill, which I'll <coughs> respond to in a minute. But the first one I'd like to respond to is a budget transfer number five, which was, has not been posted, but I think you need to know the whole relevance of all this in order to understand it. Bond, um, bond transfer number five was done um, in order to cover the, the STEM that Daryl made up last time um, and for our elementary budgets to go forward. The, um, this work we had to recover because um, originally the bond was for a elementary school, not a STEM elementary school to go forward. And we've recovered from that very easily as we go forward. Breaking up budget amendment number five into four categories is the best way to understand it. Category number one would be work to, work to be completed by MPS with sinking funds or general funds, and that's why we've built that capital funds to do so. The value of this category is 155000 It represents toilet partitions, which the district already has partitions, and we already do that type of work. Significant savings to the district to do it through our cost versus prevailing wage and through the bond. Dow High School cafeteria folding partition um, in the cafeteria. That's something our district employees can do again. No need to pay a prevailing wage through the bond as well. Paint rusty boiler stacks. This is something our district employees can easily do. Um, again, not prevailing wage going forward. Gym equipment at Jefferson. Um, we've already replaced gym equipment middle and high through our district employees. Again, savings from, from uh, not prevailing prevailing wage. Second category, I would call it work completed or already completed by MPS. This value is $1,556,000. The largest portion of this comes to tech equipment. And it was simply that the bond was built around iPads, which were $595 a piece, versus a Chromebook that's about $300 cheaper. And so that, is, that itself sets us in a very good position. All of this equipment has been purchased and deployed. All future purchases will be Chromebook type purchases as, as technology for those devices have come lower. The second largest category is furniture, which we have spent, and you have proved many of those uh, each night that you've been in, in this room. Um, these amounts have outfitted new media centers, STEM labs, and secure entrances and offices. So that has not been excluded. Category number three, I would call not presently a priority, but will be reviewed. And you'll see why some of these are in there. $1,750,000 is the value. 1.5 of that is simply the administration center renovation. So we set that aside in order to do um, our school buildings to meet those budgets. And we can review that going forward. And, you, and I'll tell you why. If you recall, we have funds to cover all of these if we choose to do so. The second one is State Street Demo, which is next to the administration center. Um, we've debated that we may need this for storage, and so therefore we've set it aside and may want to look at that in the future. The fourth and final category would be what um, I'm calling change order, which is about $80,000. And that re represents masonry repairs and miscellaneous pipe piping. <coughs> That's a hidden condition, and we expect that when we run into those devices to be able to uh, cover that under our conditions category. That in total amount is $3.5 million, and that is how we were able to cover the STEM elementary school going forward. But I must say, if you recall, we have $5.2 million. You can either call that in savings or still in the budget, um, and I'm okay with either one of those definitions. We also have well over $600,000 in interest, so we are now approaching $6 million to cover any remaining projects, which is less than $2 million. Here are some, some examples we've also done of added work, which is amounts to well over $2 million. And that's a conservative estimate of work that we've added as we've gone. 
a central park, we've added outdoor learning spaces, added playground equipment, upgraded the finishes. Auditorium upgrades, we stand the brick into exterior, exterior digital sign was added, renovations to auxiliary spaces, terrazzo polishing, light fixtures, uh, floor tiling and carpet, HVAC equipment, and extra doors and windows. Plymouth and Woodcrest, we added Woodcrest STEM makerspace. We added an AV, a audio visual systems into the special education rooms. We've added kitchen equipment. There was no kitchen equipment built into the barn. Plymouth roof replacement <coughs> was added. Painting interiors in both buildings, nearly the entire b building was painted. Added concrete walks and curves, additional marker boards and tack strips, full depth as asphalt replacement, technology infrastructure upgrades, all of the ceiling tiles at Woodcrest, lighting, electric, and gas controls, and moisture sealing on the cement slab at both buildings, where we originally just thought Central Park. Other items um, that we've done as well, um, added to it, was Northeast Controls, Dow High Controls, boilers from Mills, which we moved to the warehouse, aluminum bleachers, which we moved from Old Central Middle School to Jefferson Middle School, and we've dump, demoed the majority of the portable buildings on our campuses. And the largest item is asbestos pavement, which we have, at this point in every project, have removed full, had full removal of asbestos pavement in the district. These were not in the bonds, and these were added additional projects. So I think we're managing this quite well as we go. Post bid addendum number six, which was the issue of the post. So post addendum issue was issued to reduce the cost at both Siebert and Chestnut Hill, and that was due to the overpriced um, after we sent the bids out. The full budget for both these projects have been bid out and will be completed in 2018-19. So we, we are bidding out and now are spending the money. These are, these are not completed projects. Unlike Central Park, Central Auditorium, Woodcrest, and Plymouth, which are completed projects and exceed all bond work lists, do not judge Siebert and Chestnut Hill until they are completed projects. In addendum number six, there were space scope reductions at this time, and all the reductions were redesigned value engineering or price negotiations with, supp with suppliers that still meet the intent of the full bond work list. These projects are just starting, <clears throat> and we have 1.5 years before completion to add to these projects through bond savings, district provided work, general fund projects, or sinking fund projects, as we have done at Central Park, Central Auditorium, Plymouth, and Woodcrest. The post lists items on, on there as deleted, and I will show you that that is not the case. Chestnut Hill Elementary, it lists 26 interior security doors. Current design meets or exceeds original bond work list. Interior classroom doors are being replaced, and I'll explain that one more later. HVAC replaced. Current design meets or exceeds the bond work list. Completed replacement of HVAC system control and temperature controls. Exterior doors replaced. Negotiating lesser costs for these to do over Christmas break. Already we've got a $10,000 savings because we're doing it off peak time. We will be mindful of aluminum going up in order to move quick after, with the tariffs on this. The same, is case, the same is the case for windows replacement. Already a negotiated savings to do off peak time at Christmas because we were over cost in those areas. Digital sign. I assume this is a digital signage. This display, a single TV, was moved to the media center to improve student-occupied spaces instead of the entry space. Downspouts. Determined this was not a bond, bond priority and could be completed by MPS st staff like so many of our projects at reduced cost, particularly with prevailing wage. P pedestals Media Center. Current design meets or exceeds original bond work list. The entire media center is receiving a complete renovation. Lavatory faucets. Determined was this is not a bond priority and can be completed by MPS, st MPS staff as we have been doing all along. Replace plumbing, piping, determined this was done by not a bond priority and completed by MPS staff as we have been do doing as a, at a cost savings. Tech equipment, I've already explained, big significant savings there and the iPad to Chrome purchase. Repair masonry, minor repairs to be reviewed on site, full restoration spec deemed unnecessary. The minor repairs will be completed as, as needed. Media center lighting. Current design meets or exceeds the original bond work list. Media center getting a complete renovation. Furniture. Current design meets and exceeds all bond work lists. Remodel the bathrooms. 
determined this was not a bond priority and could be completed by MPS staff as a significant saving as we have at Carpenter and Woodcrest Elementaries. These were only partitions in the bond. So as you can see, we really have been doing the work we wanted. Not done. We have almost $6 million to cover any projects as we choose to go forward to fit that bond app. The bond app has been met, and I will be bringing this to FFO with the documentation to show and back to the full board again as we presented before for your information. My other items is um, very excited about a pro something that um, we have created called Prodigy Program. I wrote to you a while back called Promoting Rigorous Opportunities to Develop Innovative and Gifted Youth. And so we've been doing cross grading for quite some time, as some of you are aware of. have. Um, we would like to expand that to um, um, even a higher level with some of our GT kids. And so I'm really excited about that program. Um, we piloted it this year at Siebert. We're going to expand next year to, help me, Brian. Uh, every single school except for Woodcrest and Adams, they'll be the year after. Yep, and then they'll follow the year after. So this is going to be a really nice program for our highest le learners, but outside the school day, you know, so we still um, have that uh, mix in the schools as we go forward. This week I presented at Noon Rotary um, with Sheriff Scott Stevenson and Lieutenant Matthew Burchard on the very hot topic of school safety. Um, thought it went very well. Um, <laughs> we shared what we've done, shared what we are looking at to do as we go forward, and certainly legislation um, around school safety was a hot topic as well. I think we negotiated that fairly well as we went forward. Um, this, you know, as you know, both our MASA and MASB has come out against um, arming teachers, but certainly is in support of maybe arming law enforcement. And so that's kind of the stance. Um, I share it as my personal opinion since I don't speak for you in that situation. Enhancement millage we've talked about, vital for us, very vital as we go forward, over a million dollars each year um, in funding to us. Agenda group transition, seems like I've done this way too many times in the five years I've been here. I'm not sure if kept that group together, so maybe it's me, you know, maybe they don't like to work that close with me or something, so. But they do a great job for us. But Janet is uh, planning to retire in August, and so um, as I asked you guys when you, some, those who were around and interviewed me before, you, one of the things they mentioned at that time, was all three of them were going to retire, right. and Bob Cooper was put in as an interim, and that would be my appointee if I chose to do so, and of course, it didn't take me long to figure out that Bob was the keeper, and so Bob was put in, and then we've replaced multiple times. And at this time, um, we are going to move Brian over to um, the associate superintendent of what we now call ASIP, Administration of Student Services Innovative and Programs. That doesn't roll off as easy as FFO or CIA. We like our acronyms, Brad, as you said. Um, and then Penny Miller and Nelson will come in as our CIA associate. Uh, superintendent, if you know Penny, she's well ready for this position and to go forward. So um, that'll be a great transition. But as good as Bob is, we're going to lose him in a year from now. And so we got one more transition. Um, I think I have a little bit of a concept there, but too early to, t to fully talk about it as we go forward. But we'll do that as well. Special education um, realignment plan, we've discussed that tonight with parent input. And we will review that and get them a response as we go forward. So I will bring that back into our agenda committee and then back to you on any um, input we've taken in tonight. The challenge book, you read Brian's um, um, final opinion on his. So it's at Brian's level at this point in time. Uh, if the parent uh, agrees, we're, we're done. If the parent does not agree, it would come to my level. Um, and then I'll give my position. In worst case scenario, it'll come all the way to you as a full board. So we'll see where that goes as we head forward. That is all I have for you tonight. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for all the details and the work putting that together. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for addressing <coughs> the bond issue. I've never been so disappointed and sad that people would actually take it upon themselves to do that. Um, the lack of complete information that, like you said, just lying by admission. Very, very sad, and I've told people in the community that I've been involved in this bond since the very, very beginning. And if people have questions, please see me, and don't just believe everything that you read. It's important to have context around your questions. Yes. So when you have questions, it's important to right. ask those questions right. so, so we can give clear answers in case you don't have the clear answers. We have completed a lot of work with that bond bunny, and sadly, I didn't see that anywhere on this website. 
which is mm -hmm. very disappointing. Very disappointing how that information even gets out there to begin with. Well, if we need to discuss legal action, then that yeah, could be a next step. We should definitely explore it. Yes. Okay. All right. I will accept a motion uh, to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Any support? I support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs>